You know, I want to speak to those out there who are getting older. You know, as we get older, we get weaker. We can't, um, we can't do the things we used to do. You know, we, we were busy. We were show, busy showing the world how strong we were, how smart we were. And as time goes on and we're unable to do the things that we once did, it, it's natural that we can start to feel discouraged. We feel a little less than we were. We feel a little less useful. And in the world system, that that is the case. You know, our leaders, our, our politicians, more often than not, come from what the world would call a pedigree either money or a successful arena. They tend to be proclaimed as the smartest and the strongest and the fastest and the richest. So obviously <clears throat> they need to lead the way. In the Christian life, however, it's not the pattern that we typically see being played out. But essentially, the very opposite of that. You know, as far as the Bible using the word chosen or choice, elected, it's to, for a purpose, for a service, uh, not to just be equated with to receive eternal life through faith. You know, you can be called. You are you are called when someone presents you with the gospel. You may be called for a particular ministry or service. But as far as being selected or chosen, the pattern we see in Scripture is God working through things that the world would deem unfit, less than lower than and one of the themes that you see in scripture God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for you see your calling brethren that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty not many strong not many noble are called but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things or humble, lowly things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And we see why, why it, why this pattern that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is in the recorded mindset. He chooses weak, humble vessels to do mighty things. When we look at the saints of old, most recorded in the Old Testament. Those people had what the world would consider an infirmity, a um, quality of in inferiority that would make them undesirable. Rahab, one of my favorite characters, if we were to think of Rahab or someone in her situation, you would not assume by looking at her, that much could be accomplished. But as the Bible records history and what God did and who he used mightily, the pattern emerges that he uses weak things. 
And as we get older, our backs are worse, our, our strength, our stamina, all those things start to fade. I believe the Bible shows us we're not at the end of our walk, but we're actually coming to a point in where we could be more efficient, more used by God because humbleness and weakness brings about a dependence upon God. And a submissive heart can be used far more effectively than just a strong back. When we look at people like Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and, and all the others throughout Hebrews chapter 11, many, the majority, come from very humble situations. They're not the most elite. They're not the strongest. They're not the richest or any of that. When we look at who Jesus chose, elected or selected, picked to be apostles, the majority were the ragtag, lowly parts of society by earthly standards. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith, not their own majesty, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens or foreigners, and so forth. Through faith, through trusting God, out of weakness, God worked mightily in outworking of his power through them happened. Now, I, I don't want people to confuse humbleness, which is a an opinion in which you hold little importance of self, to the Calvinistic idea of self-loathing. You know, the old woe is me idea. That, that's not the same as just biblical humility in which you do not see yourself as the most important feature. You do not think yourself uh, more than others. And everybody has a manner of weakness and some more so. So if you're out there and, and your body is wearing out, you know, we have brothers and sisters who are facing quite the trial of their faith with their physical condition. Man, your doctors, family, whoever, they may see this as that you're at the end of anything that you may accomplish when the opposite could very well be true. You are in a position now that God's strength can work through you. You're in a position in which your reliance upon God, your trust in God is more now than it's ever been, making you a much more likely candidate with a submissive heart to be used to do great things because God is in that business in Scripture. Even Paul dealt with weakness. You know, he, he gets a lot of props for the things accomplished. His will and heart is at, at the key of this and God working through him. 
but even his view on his weakness, I think is very important and one that we should adopt. His thorn in the flesh that kept him from being prideful, you know, being exalted above measure. He says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he, the Lord, said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, the Lord's strength, is made perfect or complete in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You see how Paul's declaring the same thing that we touched on in 1 Corinthians. God uses the weak things to confound the mighty. The humble, the base things to work through. It's real easy to just feel that you're useless. For whatever the reason, whether it be physically, financially, academically, whatever it is, to get the idea that God just can't use me, I'm just unimportant. I don't have what the politicians have. I don't have what the university professors have. I don't have what the Olympic star has. It's not about your talents. It's really not. Talents and gifts can be used, good or bad, but it's about your heart. Where is your heart when it comes to your willingness to just yield to God's word, to just yield to the calling of the truths of Scripture? Because that's the ones we see in the Hall of Faith. Those that are not willing to endure the pleasures of sin for a season, but just to stay with the people of God, to endure the hardships that came with that. Those that are just willing to do what's right because God says it's right. Rahab, for instance, it's right. It was right to hide the spies. It's not about your perfections. It's not about your talents or your skills. It all comes down to a willing heart. And a willing heart, a moldable piece of clay, can be shaped into things that you cannot picture ahead of time. You know, when you just look at a, a big block of clay, for instance, you do not see what the potential is. You do not just automatically know what can be molded out of that block of clay, that very soft, pliable clay. But the artist does. The potter does. God is the potter. We are the clay. What the world sees as weakness, it can be the very door for which God's strength can be made perfect through you. I highly recommend reading Judges starting in chapter 6, reading through at least chapter 8. And get an idea of Gideon. You know, Gideon gets a mention and when we see a character in, in Hebrews 11, it really benefits us to go read about them. To get an idea of why they were listed in the Hall of Faith. You know, the big names, Moses, Abraham, many have read their stories. But you have three in Judges just in one passage. You have Gideon, Samson, and Barak. 
as Gideon is used by God to save Israel. Israel's was under chastisement. They had turned their back on God. It's one of those periods. They had just came out of a 40-year rest period. But then they did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And you see God delivering Israel into the hands of the Midianites. Great suffering nationally was coming upon Israel. The Bible records them as being greatly impoverished. Judges 6, verses 6. And that humility, when they did, the Medians come in, they destroy that which was sown. They, they're destroying the substance of Israel. Israel cannot rely upon their own production. They're being humbled. They're being chastened by the Lord. And it led them in verse 6, the, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. That humble state, that need to look to an outside source to do something for them. God, relying upon God, crying out to the Lord, help, save us, help. The Lord calls a deliverer to save them from the Midianites, being Gideon. When an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon in Judges uh, 6, verse 12, starts to converse with Gideon. One of the biggest important things that you'll see over and over in Scripture is the Lord will point you back to the Exodus at a time when the nation was enslaved, weak, and how he brought them out with a mighty hand. That gets a mention here as Gideon refers back and he says, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? So you would go back and read the Exodus story and get refreshed on it. This was when Israel was in a humble, weak state. God chose them for a purpose. Gideon likewise, when made the offer, in verse 14, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Gideon's reply. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. God chooses the weak things to do mighty things. God chooses the humble things to confound, to bring down, and to bring to nothing the prideful, and the things that God or the that humanity deems as things to be exalted. Gideon's view of himself: Who am I? What am I? It's not that he was self-loathing. He was just honest about his estate. I come from a poor family. And within that poor family, I'm the, the least. How could you use me? That's the attitude that we see in Gideon. But God takes that willing heart. God takes that humble attitude. And he works mightily through Gideon. Later we see as they're going into a battle, reading on in chapter six and seven or into chapter seven, we start out with tens of thousands of soldiers. However, God reduces that number to show Israel it was not by their own strength 
that these victories would come to pass, but it was God working through weak things, humble things, things the world would see as impossible to manifest his strength. So you see the reduction from tens of thousands to ultimately 300 men against an innumerable multitude of opposition so that Israel would not vaunt themselves, exalt themselves as the opinion that we these victories came through our strength, through our number, through our masses, through our power. God reduces, so read Judges 6 through 8, at least to get the full picture so that you can see the hand of God working through impossible numbers, impossible odds. 300 against that many, impossible. Despite Hollywood's take on it, naturally speaking, eventually the 300 would be overwhelmed, but that's not the case because God was with them. God fought for them. God worked through them a weak group of people. Because mankind, maybe you do it, we all do it to some degree, but we need to realize a truth. That which is outwardly continues to change. Sometimes it, it's stronger, sometimes it's weaker. Sometimes you have more money, sometimes you have less. Sometimes you can sing, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can remember an entire essay word for word. Sometimes your memory fails you. God does not look at things. He does not view people the way that we are taught to view people. Gideon would be one of your last choices to lead the way to deliver Israel. Rahab would not be your go-to when you go into a city. Do you go to the brothel and say, hey, you know, help us? You're, you might even be a little fearful to do so. God looks at your heart. When choosing a replacement for Saul, Samuel naturally did what you and I would have done. We go in, we're looking for a replacement for the king. We look at our selection. We want a strong, tall, smart physically drawing person, and we would say that one. That's who we want to lead us. But God had rejected all the other brothers prior to choosing David as king. You see, choosing, elect, select, choosing for a purpose as a king to do something, to bring about something, a purpose. But 1 Samuel 16, 7 would be a lovely one to print out, maybe put around your house. And I do recommend those things. They really do help to have those verse memorials somewhere around your house. They, they just do. And others may read them as well, which is good. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. It's that which is inside you, which was make, will bring about the reality of your usefulness or not. Do you have a willing heart? Do you have a moldable heart? Heart, mind, same thing. Is it moldable to God's will? Is it pliable? When God declares something clearly in Scripture, though you may not ultimately love the idea, are you willing to obey it, to hearken to God's counsel? Or will you just come up with some excuse? Possibly will you swing the pendulum to where you just self-loathe, self-loathe, to the point that maybe you don't realize that you're 
what you look at the most. Your weakness can manifest God's strength. And as we get older, those of us that's getting a little older, you come to understand just how frail you are physically, even mentally. And it, in my experience, and what I've, in talking to others, it humbles you and it points your head in a direction. that will turn your your eyes to God. You will come to admit your obvious need for something outside yourself to help carry you. The westernized culture is starting to, the once Christian, predominantly Christian culture, is doing many things I think we can say is evil in the sight of the Lord. In our strength, our nation's strength, the concept applies that we talked about Jesus quite a bit. We talked about the Bible quite often. But the reality was we were trusting in our own abilities. Our own production. Our own military might. Our... the. Uh, strength of our currency as viewed by others. And we made less and less time for God as we relied on ourselves more and more. We did not see the things that were happening as something to learn from and to revert back to the focus on God. We discontinued and held the course. Israel in this chapter were doing things evil in the sight of the Lord. They had sowed. The Midianites come in and destroyed. Their prosperity was fading. And they turned to the Lord. But when you begin Judges chapter 6, Understand this truth about what was taking place. And the children of the of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. This is a period of chastisement. It took that rod to humble them. It took being greatly impoverished for them to turn to the Lord, the same God, the living God that delivered them out of Egypt, that brought them to the Red Sea, that parted the river to bring them in, that gave them the land and took it from others. It took that humility, that experience, before they would look in the direction they needed to be looking all the time. As if you're dealing with weakness, know this, the Lord is there. If you have trusted Christ, the Lord is always with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And perhaps think of your situation instead of my life is over. I can't do this anymore. I'm, uh, I'm of no use to anyone. Think, well, here am I, Lord. Use me. Whatever I have, 
Use it to bring you glory. Have the attitude that you're here. You're here because he wants you here. Or else you wouldn't be. And just know that a willing heart and a humble attitude makes you very pliable and sets a background for God's strength, His power, not your own, His power to work through you. And instead of thinking your life is over, or that all that you can do is over, consider this. Maybe the real production in your life, that which you can do for God and bring Him honor and glory and those things, consider this. Maybe it took to this point in time for you to be most effective to become that which God can work most effectively through because you're no longer prideful or arrogant or self-focused or whatever it may be and that God has turned your head as a father might turn his child's head to listen this nation needs the Lord we need the Lord. Just because we're not physically what we used to be doesn't mean anything in what God can do through us. If anything, maybe we're just now ready to be used the way that we should have had we humbled ourselves long ago. So, don't be depressed. That's the natural reaction. The natural reaction is to be depressed. But just maybe, God has shelled all the things that were in the way. And now, the molding, the true molding, the true shaping can begin to take place. So I just hope that that encourages you not to look at what you have to offer in talents and strength in those things those those are temporal but just the importance of understanding a willing and obedient heart a pliable heart through a weak person through simple faith reliance upon the lord to keep his promises and trust in him to do what he said just knowing that he's there, just trusting him to get us through life. He can do anything he chooses to, anything that is impossible to man. God can make possible if that's the way he wants to use you. And just rest assured knowing with every day that our physical life plays out, one step closer to getting the experience. Complete, perfect, and true eternal life with our Lord and Savior. The world says give up. The Bible, God's Word, just keeps reminding us to look at Him. Focus on Him. Have that heart that will say, here am I. Send me. Till next time, take care and God bless.